Okay, I'm going to start with this prayer. Give to me this day a clear and watchful eye. Give to me this day a firm and gentle touch. Give to me this day a good, receptive ear. Give to me this day a clean, discerning taste. Give to me this day a subtle sense of smell. Give to me this day an openness of heart. Give to me this day an awareness now of you. Amen. I think prayers like that are so exquisite. So exquisite. Teresa of Avila always said that prayers for petition, like, can I have stuff, were that those people needed to be to told to go peel potatoes. <laughs> I like to quote that because then it's not me saying it, <laughs> though it is me thinking it. <laughs> but it's like, I, well, she said it, not me. But what is that? What am I hearing? Okay, so good morning, everybody. Um, am I hearing something? Okay, so we're all going to turn off our phones. Right, we all really are going to turn off our phones. <laughs> you know what? I made a big deal out of turning off phones one time. Big, huge, big deal. Because I, I was recording a, an audio series. And, um, and I was like off the edge about, because when you're recording, you can't stop. And you have to have this clear focus. And you're in a recording studio. And... and if someone's phone goes off, you have to stop, re pick it up, slice it in. You don't know, you know. I'm on the last of a s eight CD series. On the last one, I'm bringing the plane down, right? And the phone goes off. And I thought I would choke the person. I, all I could think of was whoever this is. I am going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. I don't look like I am, but I am. And it was my phone. <laughs> so all I could say was, oops. Oh, well. I want to start with a big, huge lecture on why this subject, why I came up with this workshop, when why it's important, and uh, why learning the skill of archetypes and seeing archetypal patterns in the collective and how they speak to you personally and your involvement and how what happens in the world around us happens within us. There is no separation. It's the mystical law. What is in one is in the whole. What is in the whole is in one. Um, how that simply is the way it is. And um, why that would be important to be able to discern that now more than ever. Um, and I've said this, you know, many times in other lectures, but with the emphasis that I'm going to say now, um, we really are living in changing times. Now, that's, you know, you'd have to be blind not to see that. You have to be numb not to see that. But the important thing, the crucial thing, is to understand how things are changing and why they're changing. It's one thing to say there's a lot of chaos out there. It's another to kind of grasp what is the meaning of all of this chaos. And now we're talking about exactly what we're going to be talking about which is the capacity to understand it at an archetypal level. So one of the ways that I teach, and if you, oh, wait a minute, I can't see anything. If you look at the, 
if you've joined me in, in reflections, you know that this is an image that I use, which is the uh, apartment building. And it really is a very, very effective way to point out, here's the penthouse, okay? To point out the way consciousness works. And that's that every one of us lives in a building. We, we are a building. And in our building, each of us, a building has numerous floors. And really, when you think of it, it's really quite phenomenal. If, if you think about people living in a building, everybody living on the different floors has the, a different view of reality in the same building. Although you have the same address. But not one of you sees the same view depending on the floor you live on. So for some of you, you have an ocean view. and For others, you don't see an ocean at all. So far as you're concerned, there is no ocean. If you have the first floor, there is no ocean. If you have the penthouse, you see an ocean and the sky and a wide, huge view of what the world looks like. But if you ask someone on the first floor, do you live near the ocean, they would have to say no. I never see the ocean, but it's the same address. So it's a really fascinating truth to understand that within you, you have all of these floors of consciousness, of perception, and that every time you go up a floor, Every way that you see the world around you does change. Everything changes, everything. And what's also true is just like in a building, the rent gets higher. <laughs> of the next floor is more expensive, the taxes are higher. It costs more money to live at a higher level. It's just more expensive. It's more expensive on your inside. The price that you're paying is an interior cost. So you pay on the inside. And you also pay with your neighbors because the more and more the higher you go, the less your neighbors want to know about all that you see. They're not interested in you coming down and saying, Oh my God, you know, now that I'm on the sixth floor, I just happened to notice that there's actually these gorgeous sunsets and there's a mountain range to my east, to our east, and the, the sunsets are these purple hues and there's rainbows out. Oh, you can't see that from where you are, can you? Well, take my word for it. Take my word for it. You just have to take my word for it. Who wants to take your word for anything? You didn't want to take anyone's word for it. You've got jealousy in you. You've got cynicism in you. Don't kid yourself. You're immortal. Don't go thinking you're evolved. Right? Stop it. So what, what you realize is with every floor you go up, the price you exact is huge. And you want to go down and tell everybody, oh my, and they're going to go like this, la, 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 la. Because nobody wants to hear that any more than you want to hear anyone from the above floors. You don't want to hear that. Especially if someone you love got there first. You don't want to hear that. You don't want to hear them go up to the two floors above and then come down and say, I'm having the most incredible experiences on the inside and it's causing me to reevaluate my values and what's important to me, which may include you and your position in my life. 
You don't want to hear that. You would like to think you're in charge of all matters of consciousness and all people in your life and their matters of consciousness, that you are at the wheel. And that's just not the way it is. So this business of ascending in consciousness is, you have to understand, is one that is terrifying for people around, terrifying for you. Um, it's, it's, and the reason is because we, what this is all about is the journey of seeing clearly, of understanding the way the world actually is, like this. When you live on the first floor, the first floor is literal. What you see is the way it is. What you read is the way it is. So if the Bible says the world was created in six days, you better believe it was. Six days. Because that's what it says. And if it says this, that's what it means. So the first floor is a floor of literalness. Literal. If you said to someone on the first floor, but symbolically, what? What? Don't you get the meaning in this, symbolically? No, it says six days. Don't you get that this was symbolic of something? These are stories representing power in that people needed to, to find a way to, to order the universe according to power, so they came up with myths. With what? That does not, that doesn't work here. This is a world down here where everything is physical, literal. That's just the way it is. In this world, things are right or wrong, up or down, good or bad, win or lose. It's a world of polarities. There's no middle ground. That's how this world is here. That's how this world settles every battle. Hammurabi's code, you hit me, I'll hit you. That's how this world functions. The idea that you would have situation ethics, that you could have some kind of discussion about not all issues are resolved in the same way. The same issue might need a discussion depending on how it happened, depending on why it happened. Circumstances soften, right or wrong, good or bad. What are you talking about? Well, things are relative. Then there's the word subjective. This is very subjective. Your, your, your way of seeing things in my way are all the way this is relative. Reality is behind your eye, not in front of it. What are you talking about? That is a perception that's up here. And someone might say, I'm not going up there. That's too high a truth for me. I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. I don't like this idea that my, what I think and what you think is two different re are two different realities. That's too much for me to cope with because then I can't control what you think. You're on your own then. And I'm on my own. Whereas if we're down here, everybody has to believe the same thing. And that's a great control mechanism. So if you stray from what everybody's agreed to believe, everybody gets to get you. See how that works? Okay. And, and then and, and what happens is when somebody breaks away and comes up here and says, oh my God, I, 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 I found a, a stairway to the second floor. On the second floor, I start thinking a little bit separate from the, the group mind. And I discover that I, I'm capable of my own thoughts. The first floor, that first floor mentality 
you can't take that with you. In other words, the world's going to be very different when you get to the second floor. You have to start constructing some thoughts on your own. But I always thought that we are, that I was the only one on the street, that, that this was just the way it was, that all of us just, that there were only people like me on this block, and the block was the only part that the world was just like me, and that there were just people like me here. And then you find the second floor, and you could see that there's a neighborhood. And there's other people in the neighborhood. And they're not all like you. And you've got to adjust. And you could go back to the tribal way of living, which says, I don't, I'm not interested in other people. I need to stay with my own kind. I feel safer there. Or you could continue the ascent and continue the ascent and continue the ascent. And eventually, as we go up, which we will continue doing, you get to the place where you separate, you step out of your own body, you step out of your own form, you unzip the body you came in. You get out and you realize this is my traveling suit. This is a suit I'm traveling in. You don't even take yourself personally. You needed a suit, you suit it up, but you unzip it, you get out, and you keep up, and you just, all you wanna learn, all you wanna know now is what's truth about the human experience. Not just for you, but for everybody. Just, just for everybody. So you can get the coordinates down here. That's what you want to know now. What are the coordinates and how are things, what's the, what's the functioning tools down here? How do they function? What's the mechanism? What are the laws? How does it work? How's everything operating here? How's it working? What's cooking here? Because we're at a time, now I'll get to that in a minute. And that's the penthouse view. An impersonal view of something that is intimately personal. And that's the way to approach life. It's intimately personal, but you want the impersonal view. It's totally impersonal. Every law of the universe is totally impersonal. Gravity, totally impersonal. Whether I drop this pen or you, it's going to fall. There's nothing personal about this pen falling if we drop it. Though it might be my pen, which makes it personal. Okay, here's the paradox. The laws of the universe are the laws of the universe. There's nothing personal about them. They become personal when you look at how they are influencing your life and how you are working with them. Then you have your personal involvement, how they work within your health, how they work within your life, how they work within your capacity to understand events in the world. This is the two. For me, God is completely represented by the laws and through prayer becomes intimate. Okay. Now, um, somewhere down here is the, the myth that God's a man. Okay. Then eventually you, you can kind of get that idea, expunge it from your myth. You know, <coughs> Although that one's a real one to get vacuumed out. And then a lot of people make it a goddess. But <laughs> the feminist goddess. But um, I highly doubt that God has feminist issues <laughs> like we do. But whatever source 
it is however it is the phenomenon of the divine force is that it is incredibly intimate and totally impersonal just like i'm discussing totally intimate and totally impersonal it knows you fully and yet you are subject to the laws that are set up in every way possible you are subject to the laws you make a choice you're subject to the consequences of the choice you made you can't pray to have the consequences taken away from you it's not going to happen and you can't say prayer doesn't work because the consequences are not removed. No. Prayer works. It said, let me be smarter next time. You got to learn how to pray. Okay. So this is, this is the nature of the, the wise journey. So to me, the, the portrait of what's happening now, which is why I think this information is so important, is that we really are at a turning point in civilization. Civilization, that's such a big word to use, such a huge word to use, that we can't even, we can't even grasp that. But, you know, the person who, the historian in me, the person who really reads history nonstop, which I've done since I was about nine. The cycles of history, you know, humanity's um, path has largely been directed by wars, always wars, always battles, always battles. So, and that's an important thing. Now, I'm going to take you all the way to the penthouse. And I'm going to tell this to you archetypally. And what I mean by that is I'm going to present it to you the way I, I probably wouldn't present it to other people. Because I'm going to tell the story the way I believe it. The way I see it. In a, in a cosmic battle. Because this is what we're going to be talking about this weekend. How to see things off the earth. How to grasp what may well be going on behi behind the scenes. Behind the scenes. Instead of in front. Instead of in front. So I'm going to tell it in two tracks. I need multiple tracks, like multiple. I can't do this. In, so the first is on um, I'm going to go back to Caesar, Julius Caesar. Maybe. I'm going to go back to the Greeks and the Romans. Yeah, I have to. Because they, when, when people were first trying to identify power, no, I think I'll go back further. Because trying, because grasping what we are living through now is so awesome that if I had a, if I could have one, me, one huge mega wish, it would be to go in the future and read what historians would write about us and how we navigated this time and the foolishness because we didn't grasp what was really happening because we didn't get it.
because we didn't get it. And we missed all the signals. We missed them all. Now, we take certain things for granted. And it's the very things we take for granted that are the clues of what we sh were missing, okay? For example, what is time? What is time and how is time created? How is time created? The only reason you know anything about time is because you wear a watch. And you're paid by the hour. And somehow those two things make you aware of time. But aside from that, and the fact that time is worn on our faces, what is time? So if we go all the way back, consider that time itself had to be created. It had to be created in consciousness. It, it just didn't exist. It didn't exist. It, it was not something that existed. It was a, it was a, it was a, a point of reality that somehow itself had to incarnate that there came a need for something called time. So before that need, there was only timelessness. That is not comprehensible to us, and yet it is so. And during that era of timelessness, human beings were far more porous porous, the way they lived on the earth was far more etheric, far more porous. They walked on a very mystical earth. This was not a place that they, they, they saw this place as belonging to the gods. Okay. This place belonged to the gods. They didn't walk around doubting that at all. It wasn't like they were, do you believe in God? And they had their spears and their little, little hairy outfits on. It was so preposterous. They, this place belonged to the heavens. Life was short, dangerous, ruthless. And as the, the Romans and the Greeks, for example, evolved their, their societies, they had no divine power whatsoever. They did not make themselves gods as we have done. Instead, they, they, they began to identify powers in the heavens. They knew that there were powers. They knew that there were cycles of powers. They identified like the Egyptians, that there were cycles, that there seemed to be order, that power was somehow or other well-behaved, structured. This was not a random place we lived in this great universe. It had form to it. It had order. So they studied it again and again to learn its order. And they figured something had to be in charge and it must be the gods, the gods. They didn't think it was one. The Jews thought it was one. They were the monotheologic people. But they're ordering, trying to figure out what's going on in the heavens. And with the Greeks and the Romans, they have this idea, and, and the Jewish, all the religions, there was no such thing as the God inside. 
And this is very, very important to understand that all the power was outside. So they, would, they were observing it. But then came the next generation. And as they were beginning to get comfortable with power, the next generation was Hercules, Ulysses, half God, half man. But they were still gods. They were still myths. But then came Jesus, who was actually really half God and half man, or so the myth went. And then the incarnation of gods stopped. It stopped. And there would be no more incarnation of the half God, half man myth. That was the end of the line. The end of the incarnating of power into the human experience. And it was this human being who said, now this power, this celestial power, all of this power, all of this cosmic power is in you now. I'm going to show you how that works. And he was the teacher of the law. Remember, the teacher of the law. It's very important that as you look through these centuries, that what was incarnating here was the densification of the human experience. It was becoming very fossilized. We were becoming matter. We were becoming matterized, if you will. It was human beings that were actually becoming um, more physical. It was our merger that was happening, cosmic and physical. So just put that in the back of your head. Because as we, as the centuries progressed, we ceased to be able to see the other side that we could see so easily. We cease to be able to penetrate through the veil. We cease to be able to maneuver with the companions on the other side. That we lost contact as we became more rational and reasonable, the curious thing is that we acted more irrationally and unreasonably. Our decisions became more and more insane. We'll get to that in a minute with war. But pri as long as we had the companionship of angels, as long as we had the companionship of the other side, There was a level of uh, fear and, tr and, and, how do I say, pr um, people knew their place. People knew their place. And they knew that they were part of nature. And it's really interesting to me. Um, when I used to, when I read the Old Testament long ago, and, you know, it would say God sent, you know, legions of, you know, 200,000 angels to fight with the Israelites, da 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 da. Today, I believe that's literally what happened. Literally. Actually, literally what happened. That 200,000 angels physically manifested and fought like soldiers alongside them. I think everything that is said in the Old Testament about what angels did is actually literally the case. I think that when they say that angels visited Abraham, that's exactly what happened. Came up to him and said hi, and they, he sent them and sat with them in his tent. It would have been exactly the way it was said, literally, physically. That at the Passover would have been where the angels came in and said, take, put blood on your houses, the angel of death is coming tonight. And 
that's exactly it would not have been an apparition the dream angels didn't start till later it would have been just like that because they didn't know it wasn't like that they didn't know it wasn't like that they had no other reference for how heaven communicated with them that's how it was they had no other reference zero so of course it was like that of course it was and as the centuries followed the angelic apparitions became more energetic and not physical they became visionary after Jesus they became visionary because an interior opened up consciousness opened up and this is really important to understand they became interior because the consciousness of the human of the individual opened up which suggests that something more was expected of the human being in terms of your capacity to understand the nature of the world you live in the na- your own nature okay and as um, and then what it, I'm going to push it up to the 1500s which is the great turning point you know at that point like you have all these great mystics that kind of coalesced in the 1500 and it was like the the apex of it with John of the Cross Francis of Assisi Ignatius Loyola right after Francis of Assisi uh, uh, Teresa of Avila all these great big huge ones all of whom had visions apparitions discussions Catherine of Siena all of them and then after that we have the age of reason the age of enlightenment the age of the rational mind and I'm telling you this as a prelude to where we are now so you understand that as we went into the rational age we were actually going into the most irrational age we actually were going into where we would net what we thought was the age of enlightenment was the actual age of unenlightenment we were leaving the age of of light and we were paradoxically going into the age of darkness we were going into an age of separating from nature we're going into an age of dominating instead of cooperating we're going into an, an age of tremendous um, arrogance. And tremendous war. Okay. And that leads us to, I'm going to fast forward here, to the ultimate war to the turning point war which was World War two and I'm gonna put you back in the penthouse so the World War two might well have been for all the other things the the war that put good and evil in front of people the most clearly of any war ever fought on this earth of any war ever fought the sides were so in the theater in, in Europe the sides were so obvious what was good what was evil there, it, there was just no option there what was good what was evil who the good guys were and who the bad guys were it was so clear and everybody knew who chose sides and then what happened and this is a big a big deal to get this it was as if good and evil and this is what I mean by archetypal I want you to hear it symbolically 
It's as if the forces of good and evil knew that an evolution of the nuclear age was coming. It was inevitable and it was coming. Okay? We were going to enter it one way or another. We hadn't become people of peace yet. So we were going to enter it one way or another. Right. And tragically, we, we were entering it through a war. Okay. So, at the end of the war, when op and the Manhattan Project happened, I want you to think of the story of, of Prometheus stealing the fire from Zeus. We stole the fire again. And Prometheus, what Zeus did was to punish Prometheus, he hung him by a rock so that the buzzards would eat his liver out again and again and again every day. Before he did that, then Zeus said to the goddesses, make me a false goddess. Pandora. And he sends Pandora down with Hermes down to Epimetheus as a gift. Prometheus had warned his brother, don't take anything from the gods, you can't trust them. But of course, this is a myth and nobody pays any attention to warnings and Pandora was seductive. And he marries Pandora and the wedding presents the box. And out comes all the toils and the sufferings. We entered the nuclear age through war, through war. It's as if we learned nothing. And in splitting the atom, we directed it toward destruction. That nuclear power was a weapon. And ever since then, we've been chasing the fire. What country has it? Who has it? Do terrorists have it? It has determined everything about every politic, every country. It's determined everything. Archetypally, it has given rise to the terrorist archetype. It's given rise to the barbarian again. It's given rise to numbers of archetypes that we'll go into. But here's two other points that are really, 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 really important to grasp that people don't see, and it's a real penthouse view. Um, the two fundamental circuits, two fundamental drives, instinctive drives, these are the deepest drives you have, human beings have, too, are the need to create and the need to survive. That's it. If these two malfunction in you, or even one of them, you're going to be in trouble. Okay? These two drives have been with humanity since the time of the beginning of humanity the need to create, the need to survive. Ever since entering the nuclear age, they have been morphed. They're morphed. We, post-nuclear human beings, are the only ones that have ever had every single day doubting whether or not we would survive. It's in the air, it's in our water, it's in our food. It's in our plant life, it's in our GMOs, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. 
It is everywhere. It's in our bottled water, it's in our this, it's in our that. We are the only generations that have no sense of whether or not we will make it. At all. That has morphed us. And it's absolutely, un it's, you were so accustomed to it that we've incarnated the morphing. But here's what it's done to creation. Continually, everything we create is destructive or short-lived. From housing, to construction, to relationships, to products, to whatever. We no longer do long-term things. We no longer trust that relationships will last. Builders use the cheapest material. Most of what things that are created now are completely destructive from pharmaceuticals to GMOs to anything. We have become inverted. Inverted. How many stories come out every single day about, oh my God, don't touch this, it's poisoned. Oh my God, don't eat this, it's poisoned. This is poison, dog food's poison, things that are imported from China are poison, this is poison, that's poisoned. Constantly. Oh my God, sugar's poison, flour's poison, this is poison, that's poisoned. We live in a society where, even if it isn't, we've grown so paranoid that we think everything's poisoned. We don't even get that we are now completely survival paranoid. We are completely survival paranoid. Totally. And a lot of what I see in people when I do readings is there's nothing wrong with them. You're survival paranoid. Well, I can't eat gluten. I can't, I've got to be gluten free. I've got to be this. I've got to be that. No, you're not. You're survival paranoid. You've, this has been incarnated into you so strong that you are now psychosomatic. <laughs> and you've just drunk too much of this Kool-Aid. And you are survival paranoid. And this is how it's coming. Well, they, the doctors can't find anything wrong with you. Of course not. Because there is nothing medically wrong with you. You've gone survival paranoid. And this is completely in keeping with the toxicity of the psychic field in which we live. Can you relate to what I'm saying? And part of, and another, and another extension of what I see from this is in the way in which relationships have morphed. And that relationships find it very difficult to do. We, we, we've created all these relationships that go like, people don't, don't say, I, I'm in relationship. What, the, what does that mean? I'm relating. What does that mean? Well, we're living together. But if you're really serious, you're living together. But then you buy a place together. So now we're living, but we bought a place together. So that's really serious versus just living together. Or you're a friend with benefits. Or you're this or you're that. So there's all these different verses saying we're actually getting married. All these ways of dancing around the block. Because the idea of really making a commitment is not what it used to be because that's so long. It's so long. So this is another part of this, we, it just won't survive. Things just don't survive. Do you have any questions about this so far? Anything you want to ask or? No? Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah. No, no, it's it's, it's genuine paranoia. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. Right. Right, right, right. That's what I'm saying is we really are living in an era of where we have, in fact, this is what makes this the big turning point in civilization is that for all the other times, war has created a crisis. And it has. We are now at a place where this is the first time that the changes, you know, all the other wars, all of them, World War I, World War II, which were the biggies, societies survived, countries survived, well, some of them, but we survived, Europe survived, and Africa survived, and et cetera. And the pillars that a society relies on survived these wars, meaning the religions in the country, banking survived, um, the values of the family survived, um, the fundamental communities survived, the fundamental tenets that a society relies upon to build itself, education survived, to rebuild, held intact, and reignited as soon as the war was over. People could rebuild societies because the banks were back, the churches were there, the synagogues were there. They were back and they could count on it. All of those are gone now. We have taken down all the pillars this time, all the pillars of society that society has always relied upon. A collective sense of trust in, in, in banking, gone. Only a fool trusts the bank now. Only a fool will trust the church or a religious institution. Only a fool will trust anything that the government says. There is nothing out there. We have no collective sense of value. None. Everybody's on their own. There are no agreed upon values in this society whatsoever, none. And that is terrifying. Everybody's on their own, on their own. There are absolutely no agreed upon set of values, zero. Kids can wear what they want. There's just no agreed upon set of morals, nothing. Nothing. And that's why I, I don't understand why people are so appalled when they have sexting, texting. Who cares? Who cares? Who cares? That's the way our society is. We have a who cares society. <laughs> okay? There's no agreed upon anything anymore. And not just here. There's a lot of this in Europe. There's a lot of this everywhere, but it's spreading. There are no, and, and, and they want to take down the standards in EPA. They want to take no agreed upon anything anywhere. And this is also in the world. There's no, there's just a chaos <laughs> further. This is the first time in the history of the planet where we have to wonder, will there always be water? Fracking is only help adding to that. Will there always be food? You, you can think the unthinkable. No. No. There may not be. We can't comprehend that. Well, we should. We should. Will there always be air? Mm -mm. Maybe not. Maybe not. We can't comprehend that. I don't know, I mean, if we comprehended that, what would we do, collect oxygen tanks? I have no idea. 
But the fact is, I mean, this is the first time every single form of life is on the line. Every form of aquatic life, we're using the ocean to dump trash. There are trash heaps the size of Texas floating around the ocean. And here's another thing. People throw their drugs down the toilet. Drugs go into the water. Fish drink the water. The fish you eat have birth control pills in them. They have Prozac in them. You think fish is fresh, you're crazy. You're crazy, you're crazy. The fish are as drugged as you are. <laughs> you know, you could have a heroin addict for a salmon. <laughs> I mean, people are nuts if they think fresh fish is fresh. Okay, everything is drugged, sick, everything. Birds are fly dropping out of the sky. I mean, there is absolutely nothing. This has never happened before. Ever, 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 ever. And, and the lunacy of politicians is over the edge. I mean, and, and if you look at it from the first floor, you will end up blaming. You will end up saying, there's that damn person again. There's that stupid this. There's that stupid that. Well, you don't get anywhere. You cannot solve anything on the first floor. You got to get, out, including anything in your life, including anything at all in your own life. You can't solve anything. You can't understand anything, and you can't solve or resolve anything on the first floor. And this is the point. You can't. You can't. You can't. You can't. The only thing you will end up doing on the first floor is getting filled with hatred and fear and blaming someone as if any one person or any group of people could possibly make this planet the hellhole of a mess that it is right now. Okay? It's just not possible. Not even Bush. Okay? All right. You have to come up here. You have to stand back and say, what's really going on here? What's really, really going on here? Because if you can understand it from up there, you can understand the significance of the choices, the necessary choices that have to be made. You can understand that, that there are choices that make sense that have to be made that at any point in time, just like Um, epidemics don't happen just like that. They just don't fall out of the sky. It's time for an epidemic. They happen because the, there, there's a setting. There's an there's a, um, atmosphere, a psychic atmosphere that becomes ripe. In 1929, the stock market crashed. And, w and, and if you read the newspapers right after that in the 30s, they, they said we, f we were economically crippled. That's what they said. And we had a polio epidemic. Said economically crippled. And we elect a president with polio. And people don't know he has polio. Roosevelt was very clear to keep that a secret. And then after the war, when we were feeling really important and very successful and good again, we said we were economically on our feet again. And Jonas Salk found the vaccine. And that was the track. Now, the point here is, if you get how archetypes work, you know that with shifting archetypes, shifting archetypal consciousness, shifts problems, shifts a way out, that, the, that the, the, the society can, the human consciousness, the human community can shift gears and get out of its hellhole. And in New York second, 
if it's consciousness shifted gears. It, it just, if it's consciousness shifted, it would find ways to resolve its pollution. It would find the people who could channel that, who could get the idea, and then draw the team that would make it happen, would come together. There'd be a way through the nightmare. It would take the support team of human beings, that sort of consciousness. It would just tip the balance 51%. That's why becoming conscious, even holding prayer in your heart, whatever it is, matters so much. It's like getting you to vote for the right candidate. Just go out there, one vote, every single vote, every single conscious per person makes a difference. It makes a difference. Every, every, every part of you that can see things with greater clarity and how you work in your own life symbolically, seeing things with clarity, getting the bigger picture so that you can say to someone else, you got to see it better so that you're a messenger of it. You gotta understand that maybe there's something bigger going on here. You know, maybe there's something bigger going on in your own life. And that you understand, why am I tied to this event? Or am I tied to this event? Or why do I have some connection to, to this or that? Or, or, you know, am I tied to uh, every time I, I, I see things that go on in, in uh, um, um, war zones or with homeless people, I just feel something happening to me biologically or I just have this feeling, you know, maybe you have something to do with healing that part and you don't know it. You could have been drafted by the reserves. I'll explain how that works with archetypes how you could be drafted. You don't even have to leave your house, but your soul's used as a channel. Or you just get like, you could feel things going through you because you have extra reserves on you. Because remember, one of the laws of energy is it can't be destroyed or recreated, but if, it, if it's free radicals that need to be cleaned out, they've got to go through somebody. And if you happen to be on the support team for that archetypal issue, it's going to go through you and a bunch of people on your support team. Okay? So, now, I also wanted to, to say that this, do I have to define archetypes for anybody? Do, am I, are we past that? Okay. Okay. So, I think of an archetype as a label. We label everything. We can't, we're compulsive. We have to label people, we label everything. Do you ever people watch? Okay, and when you people watch, do you ever say things like, that person looks like this, this? That's an, you're picking their archetypes. You're archetyping them. It's as simple as that. But don't you wonder how come you can do that? Right? That's because by instinct, that's an energetic instinct. By instinct, we can do that. Because we're that psychic. That's a, you've got more people in here who would look at you and know more about you five archetypes in you right now without even talking to you. Without even talking to you. I'm afraid to even do an exercise because I know so many of you and there's so many of you who know each other. I'm say, if I said, find someone you don't know, could you do that? Yeah. Find someone you don't know. See if you could find someone you don't know. <laughs> Keith and Kai... Keith and Kai, stay away from each other. <laughs> See if you could find someone you don't know. <laughs> and, and as soon as you find someone, don't tell them anything about you. Don't say anything. Just find someone you don't know. Yeah. 
and take your paper with you. Take a notepad with you. <laughs> Do you two not know it there? Partner. Got it. All right, one more. Do I have a do I have a loose end? Colleen? Go right there. Okay. One more. Oh, wait a minute. Right here. There you go. What are you what's your name? We know each other. Oh, you know each other. Okay. Okay, Colleen. Okay. Okay, wait a minute. Swap off. <laughs> Swap off. Here we go. Swap off. Okay. Okay. All right. You guys can actually sit down. I mean, we can sit down. Okay. You're going to do an exercise here. Now, uh, quietly, just look at each other and then figure out six archetypes that person is. You can't talk to each other. You can't, no, no, I mean, just figure out six archetypes. You're just impression. Just impression, you can't talk. Just that impression that this person strikes you as. Six archetypes. Now, you know the child victim saboteur. You get to use two of those, but, but, you're going to have to describe a little bit about that person's child or, because, I, because you're off the hook there, but you have to say something. This is fun. <laughs> no, because this is part of t showing you how absolutely intuitive you really are and how good at this you are. You can't talk because otherwise the other person's going to give something away. I'll tell you when you could talk. You could talk later. Just do this quietly, just impressions. Because here's the thing. When you are doing readings, readings of anything, you're not going to be able to interview what you do a reading on. You simply have to get intuitive data. You don't get to talk to it. You've got to trust your gut instinct. And here's another thing about gut instincts. Uh, they're fast. Take it from me. They're lightning fast. Don't dwell. You'll start making things up. First thought, best thought. Be very Buddhist. First thought, best thought. Yeah. I know you are. But you're cute. Um, this is about you be really becoming aware of how intuitive you are, that you use the skill all the time, all the time. Okay, you almost done? Yep. All right, I have, now here's a fun thing. I want you to ask your partner one question for, that you are seeking intuitive advice on. A personal question. Like, yeah, ask your partner a question as if that person wasn't intuitive that you were seeking advice. Ask her a question or him a question. Like, I'd like your advice on, and you want their gut instinct. Isn't that fun? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, go for it. Should I buy a house? Should I... Mm. Yes. Um, how'd you do on the archetypes? Good. Isn't that fun? Isn't that fun? But what you, what you, what's really important for you, yeah? Okay, good. Is that you realize how good you are at reading archetypal patterns. 
is that it is an, that you've been doing it all along. That you have this absolute natural instinct to do this, to see things symbolically. That you that it, you can't stop it. That if I said to you, stop it, stop labeling, stop it. That you couldn't stop it if you tried. You could not stop it if you tried. And you couldn't stop looking for meaning in things if you tried. You absolutely couldn't stop it. Which means you're wired, you're wired to look for the what's really going on here. It's a natural wiring in you. You're all, it's in and you know, when I did sacred contracts, and I want to add, add something here about sacred contracts, I, because it's important here, that I thought um, it came about in the beginning because uh, I did a reading with Norm, and I um, it saw the first reading was uh, on a man... The way I did readings with Norm is that he lives in Springfield, Missouri, outside Springfield. He lives in a little place called Fairgrove. And uh, he had this patient in his office. And he'd always call up and he'd say the patient was, he'd give me name and age and always had the patient's permission. And I would get an impression. And this time, and the impressions are very fast, just like that for me. And but um, I got the impression of a, a little boy, and he doesn't, he doesn't deal with children. So I said, uh, this isn't working because all I'm seeing is a little boy and this type of thing and a kind of a wounded little kid. And, and I described this, which of course was this person's basic psychic personality. And um, well, as Norm explained that, he said, well, just keep going. And then I talked about how that would, he said, well, if this influenced the illness, how would you think it would influence the illness? And that's how was my first archetypal reading. And after that, that's all I wanted to do because I, that was a whole new world for me, wow. Ooh. But through the years, you can imagine how many I've done now, thousands, who knows thousands. The idea of contracts came along, and that's important to this subject matter, because eventually with contracts, what I realized is that we don't fall from trees. Our lives are very well organized, not to the point where we are organized in terms of day-to-day -day, you know, kind of stuff. But what's very organized in a soul's journey is that you incarnate, we incarnate on, on a schedule, okay? There's a timing and where we incarnate is, 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 is chosen. And, and there is a harmony to where and why we incarnate. That's not a random act of life. And if you look at life, there's nothing random about life. Everything in the system of life is beautifully connected and beautifully ordered, as is your life. And that part of what orders you is the timing of your birth, and the connections of your um, uh, archetypal myths and how they fit into the whole and how they're needed at that time during the, uh, in the whole. That your wiring is essential to what's going on in this time period. So let me say this again. Um, the, 
the archetypal patterns that you have are um, your way of, maybe how do I want to say this? It's, it's so clear to me that communicating this is sometimes the most difficult part of all. Archetypal patterns, or maybe I'll draw it. Sometimes drawing helps. Here's Earth, just Earth. And then here's what we want to think of as the Earth's soul atmosphere. And then here's archetypal patterns, these little zeros. OK, let's do it this way. And these archetypal patterns are like the wheels around which evolution moves. And they're the magnetic that move the psychic field of humanity. And how this works is that each one of these is loaded with stories. Loaded with stories. Like the princess and the knight. So this is the princess and the knight. And so if you want a story about a princess and a knight, you come up here to this archetype. And you go to its archive, and you find out about princess and knight. And if you incarnate, and you're connected to that, here you are, you're connected to that archive. And so those mythologies will go into you. And if you're not connected to it, you won't have that archetypal link. OK, but if you are connected to it, you would be one of those people who are obsessive about Princess Diana. I don't have the princess archetype. I don't have it. And, and when. When I was with girls who had it, women who had it, during the princess thing with Diana, I was like, oh my god, what is wrong with you? <laughs> you know, but there's just like no buzz there for me. OK, no buzz. Zero. Zero. Less than zero. OK, less than zero. If there could be less than zero. OK. But the mythologies of the princess and the knight are in certain people. I've got my own. I, I'm not sitting here criticizing. I can get to some of my own that would make you go, oh, Jesus. <laughs> OK? But these mythologies are as old as for 2,000 years, the, uh, well, 1,500 years. And these are great stories that go back to France and Spain and, and England and chivalry and et cetera, et cetera. And when you are born and you are wired to this, everything about chivalry and knights and those stories and Robin Hood, everything about it triggers a romantic thing in you, triggers romance. Triggers, oh, oh, you see a man that looks knightish to you, and you go, oh. right? It just is. And you could spot a man who's a knight. You walk in, and you, you could look in a crowd of, you know, and all of a sudden, there's, there's one. <laughs> just like you did right here. Just like you did right here how fast you spotted the archetypes in each other. That's how fast you pick out an archetype. You go this fast, yes? Are there new archetypes forming that we humans have never Yes, before? time traveler. But I mean, are there ones being created right now that maybe you haven't even gotten to know? Oh, of course, of course. So we're evolving in that way as well. We are absolutely evolving, for example, we are about to enter another thing that, that is characteristic of why this time is like no other, is that we're about to join the galactic community, OK? Which will 
completely dispel every religious myth we've ever had. Because all religious myth is Earth-centric. And what are you going to go tell extraterrestrials that their God was born in Israel on December 25th or the Messiah's coming, the what? You know, this ca I mean, really? And gee, we're glad we know that because we live in a galaxy way the hell away and it's taken us light years to get here, but we're glad. We'll let us know when he gets here. Um, that this, the, every single religious mythology, and that's come up to the penthouse. This is one of the reasons why everything's crumbling. It's because what's going on in the heavens is a collision of the gods. Every single religious mythology is crumbling. It can't with sustain itself now. And the way it's crumbling is that at the earth level, it's just the bottoms falling out it's falling on there people things are falling on their own swords you know their own swords certainly the catholic church its own swords but it was going to fall anyway it was scheduled to fall so all of this portends the brand new archetypes one of which will be time traveler Absolutely. And then there, and, and if, for example, one of, one, one, uh, the teacher Jesus will survive. The teacher Jesus will survive. The idea that he was a God hopefully will not. But that he was a cosmic being a being with a cosmic soul, which is exactly what human beings should strive for. They would proportion it correctly, might in fact have a chance to make it. And that he was married to Mary Magdalene. That they would finally tell the truth about him. Instead of this endless, unmitigated, consummate BS they would finally tell the truth. It would be very refreshing. So angels, will still be. angels aren't going anywhere. <laughs> angels are not a myth. You know, the cosmic hierarchy exists. Cosmic hierarchy exists. But um, that's real. They're not going anywhere. Um, but, the, but one of the mythologies, I mean, not mythologies, one of the, what's happened over the last couple of decades here is probably hopefully going to disintegrate, which is the commercialism of angels. What? What? No, I, 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 I am appalled by that. Since when can you make a cosmic being appear on stage, like channel a cosmic being just like that? And Michael, are you, are you for real? You're hallucinating, you mad idiot. <laughs> you desperate mad idiot. Just throw a quarter and turn it into a charity case. But no, that kind of thing does not happen. So hopefully, reverence will return. Because, by the way, you should read St. Paul, who during his three days of blindness was taken to the realms of angels. And he wrote about them. Do you remember that? He, what, what passage is that? Yeah, he was communicating. He, but he does the best description of, he says, there's angels, there's the guardian angels, there's the cherubs. He says, there's the angels that govern the countries, there's the angels that govern the planets. And he just goes on and on about all the realms of angels because when he was out of his body, when he was blinded for three days, he kept having these great tours. 
And he really, really, I mean, God escorted him to many places. And that kind of knowledge is eternal. Yeah, it paid to be a centurion. Okay, so I want to go back to you with your contracts. Your personal archetypes are attached to events that are happening. I'm going to go back to Diana and, and Charles and changing archetypes. This particular archetype is going into retirement. The princess in the night. It's going into retirement. It served its purpose. And it's kind of now going into the archives as it were. And um, you could say that the, the story of Diana and Charles was a story of the closure of that archetype. That they were the last actual princess in the night. And their story really ended very much like a classic story of the princess in the night, except the pieces were almost backwards because they never do live happily ever after if you know literature and princess and knight, whether it's Snow White or um, some of the other stories. They, I mean, by the time the prince got to her, she was dead in a box. And in many of the other stories of the princess of the night and the night, they never do live happily ever after. They don't make it. So they never made it to happily ever after. So you never ever see them um, kind of going the full day. And I think one reason it struck people, like their, their, her death struck people as being so it wasn't just that the greatest woman in gossip just passed away, although that certainly was part of it. It was because it was the end of a mythology. There would never again be a great princess knight combo. It was the end of it, and everybody just, it was the end. That was it. What's the name? William and Kate are not a great princess knight combo. They're just... Princess, who cares about they just it because it's over, and she's not really royal blood. They'll never be royals again. It really is over now. They're in the denouement. So that's you could see that this is in retirement, and you see that world events follow what's happening. It always does. It always does. Always, always, always does. And it's so funny because your own archetypes are always attached. Any of you have a princess? You wouldn't admit it now. Come on, there's got to be. <laughs> oh, yeah, all right, Kai's got a princess. There's got to be more than one. I only have one princess. Oh, in my I like Jody. Okay, Jody, yes. Yeah, no, it is. It's being retired. Yeah, it's in its denouement. Because you could, it's just, and you could feel like it's just, you could feel the lights out in it. Can't you feel it, sort of? Like it's just not, it doesn't have the punch that it, that it had, you know, it just doesn't have the punch. And if you read stories about some princess and you're, you're like, ah, pfft. you know, it doesn't have that kind of impact anymore. It just doesn't, okay? Um, at any rate, these, these archetypal patterns, each one of them, back to myth, is a archive of mythologies. And those mythologies, to, uh, and when each, when I was doing sacred contracts, each human being, we, we are the collective of the 12 archetypes that we have, 
And those myths talk to us. Those myths talk to us. And what happens is as events change in the greater world, there's a dialogue that goes on in you with the events that are going on in the world. And the pull and tug that you have is because you're attached to whatever. You are a participant in the dynamics that are going on in the outside. So let me say this again. Because if I'm not saying this, stop me. But like some people are environmentalists. Or some people are passionate about, oh, let's say environmentalists. And that is an archetype that never existed before. Okay, you could say it's almost like the grown up nature child, but the environmentalist never existed before. So that's an archetype that evolved because it had to evolve. And, there, it, and it's so new that it doesn't yet even have stories and myths that go along with it. Doesn't have any, really. Doesn't have any great fairy tales. It doesn't have any mythologies. It doesn't have any great legends. It doesn't have anything that goes along with it at all. So it hasn't been hung very high. But it is an archetype, but it just is brand new. And that's how you know it's brand new. It doesn't have any, anything yet. It's hollow, it's yet to be filled. It doesn't have any collective beliefs. It doesn't, it doesn't have anything yet. And yet, when someone's in it, so which is why, and this is archetypal, when you're an environmentalist, the most you can share is a body politic. The most you share is a body, in other words, you share politics, you share a cause, but you're not yet at the level where you share a myth, because there isn't a myth. Do, do you get that? It's not yet unconscious where there's a myth. So everything that you share is a cause, because it hasn't yet become an unconscious myth. It's not old enough or mature enough. It hasn't cooked on the burner enough. It's on its way, but it, it's got to cook on the burner. It's got to mature. But anyway, those who are, and you know, is it, am I making sense here? Yes. You know, it hasn't lived long enough to, do, to develop an archive of mythologies to where where people can identify what's the power of an environmentalist. What's the thing that all environmentalists believe? We don't know yet. They obviously all believe in the environment, but what do they believe about the environment? We don't know yet. So it's this kind of thing. We don't know yet. We've got we've to gotta wait and see. And yet, all environmentalists have a passion for life and for the earth. Okay. And oh, let me add something. The reason I wanted to bring it up is also this, and that's that if you have that archetype, here you are, it connects you to environmental concerns. It just connects you. You are connected like an electrical current to environmental dynamics. Even if you are unaware of it, you're connected to it. It's like being plugged in. And you're part of that evolution of the environmental dynamic. You're just part of it. And it will affect your health, it affects your psyche, it affects everything. So you could be, you could just be, or, you know, in an ordinary day and suddenly feel yourself fully drained. 
I don't know if you've ever had that experience, just completely drained of your energy, just wiped out. And just feel like, I have got to go to sleep. I need to recharge. And in fact, what's happened is you could have just been used to just flush out some psychic free radicals. Just like that. Just like recharging your battery. And you have to recharge your battery. Okay? It's an interesting thing to talk about. Okay. I've just gotten a signal for a break. Let's have a little break time.